In 1929, the loaning aeronautical company was taken over by Curtis Wright. The new owners wanted to move the company and its production facilities to Pennsylvania. However, a small group of loaning employees didn't feel like uprooting their lives and moving across the country. Five individuals, Leroy Grumman, Julius Holpitt, Albert Loning, William Schwendler, and Jake Swerbel chose to remain and formed the Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation. Unlike some manufacturers, who started on unsteady financial ground, Grumman would have an easier beginning. It was completely and privately financed by Grover Loning, who also provided the manufacturing rights to the Loning retractable landing gear hull and the float designs. This secured an early line of cash flow, along with their first Navy contracts, and this allowed Grumman to develop and produce the Model A and Model B floats, which equipped the Vought O2U and O3U observation planes. These early production runs allowed the company to develop its facilities, which led to the development of their first fighter, the FF, and they were soon approached about the development of an amphibious aircraft as well. In 1931, the US Navy reassigned the letter J as the designator for a new type of general utility aircraft. Previously, J had been used solely for transports. These new utility aircraft would be purpose-built for deployment with utility flights aboard carriers, at shore bases, and attached to special utility vessels. The first design received by the Navy would not come from Grumman, however. The newly relocated Grover Loaning Aircraft Company submitted a privately developed design called the X02L1. This shared many of the design features of Loaning's earlier models, but in general it was more streamlined and modernised. The US Navy tested Loaning's prototype in 1932, and it received high praise, but Grover Loaning had no production facilities to meet the Navy's requirements. It was then that the Navy approached Grumman, who had now already established production of their FF fighter, to redesign the prototype and submit their own proposal. Grumman quickly completed preliminary design work, and a prototype was ordered under the designation XJF-1. It was designed as a compact, single-bay biplane which had a crew of two seated in tandem. It featured a fully enclosed canopy, something that was finally becoming more commonplace in aircraft design, and it could also accommodate two passengers seated side by side in the rear of the float. Access to this compartment was through a set of folding doors in the floor of the rear of the cockpit, as the float was fed into the fuselage in a style typical of loaning designs. Being an amphibian, it also featured a traditional landing gear, the main landing gear retracted into the float, and the tail wheel, along with its housing, doubled as a water rudder. Meanwhile, for carrier operations, it had an arrestor hook that extended down from the rearmost section of the fuselage. Power would be provided by a Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp, which was a 14-cylinder radial engine that was rated at 700 horsepower. Though later models would be unarmed, the prototype was designed to carry a 30 caliber machine gun, which was operated from the rear cockpit, and a single 100-pound bomb could be carried under each of the lower wings. The XJF-1 was completed by April of 1933, and flew for the first time on the 24th, taking off from a grass field in front of Grumman's Long Island factory. It was then delivered to the Naval Air Station in Washington, D.C. for flight evaluations on the 4th of May, 1933. These evaluations passed without any major problems, and the only minor redesign work that resulted from them was to the vertical tail surfaces. Evaluation flights had revealed some longitudinal instability, and while it wasn't horrific, its effects would be exasperated in poor weather conditions, especially when it came to carrier operations. The tail surfaces were thus redesigned into a broader, squarer shape, and upon returning for follow-up examinations, the prototype was accepted, and what would become known as the Grumman Duck was ordered into production. Full production began at the start of 1934, and the first JF-1 entered service at the Naval Air Station in Norfolk, Virginia, during May of 1934. Several iterations of the Duck would be developed over a short period of time, and as a result of this, only 27 of the original JF-1s would be produced. Many of these would serve with the Marine Corps starting from February 1935. 
In total, JF-1s serving with VJ-1 Utility Squadron would be attached to USS Wright, USS Saratoga, USS Lexington, USS Ranger, and USS Heron. JF-1s were also present at fleet air bases in the Canal Zone, Pearl Harbor, and the Philippines. While the provision for offensive and defensive armament was retained with the JF-1, most operating aircraft had this removed, so that an additional crew position for a radio operator could be added instead. Along with the JF-1, production had also begun on the JF-2, which had been specifically ordered for use by the US Coast Guard. These were built from the outset as unarmed aircraft, and could be easily identified by the loop antenna of their radio direction finder. The only other major differences between the JF-2 and the JF-1 was the removal of the arrestor hook and a change in engine, with the newer model powered by a 9-cylinder Wright Cyclone. This engine was smaller than the Twin Wasp, but produced the same amount of power. In total, 15 of the JF-2s would be built over the course of 1935, and they would be operated across various coastal states on the US mainland, as well as Hawaii and Alaska. As production on the initial model of the Duck was winding up, a final variant was also built. A batch of five JF-3s were built for Navy and Marine Corps Reserve units in 1935. Again, these were now powered by a 9-cylinder Wright Cyclone, though it now produced 750 horsepower instead of 700, and they were delivered without arrestor hooks as well. When the last of these were delivered by Grumman, production was halted so that modifications could be made to the aircraft's overall design. Not long after the first JF-1s had been delivered for the Navy, it was realised that with some design changes, though none of them were considered major, the Duck could be used for target towing, smoke laying, medical transport, or reconnaissance duties. Though it wasn't a complete redesign, enough changes had been made that the new design differed from the JF series enough to receive the new designation of J-2F. The J-2F series of Duck carried additional equipment in light of its new multi-role design, but with the exception of having the float extended by an additional foot and the change of power plant, the airframe itself remained largely unchanged. The first J-2F-1 flew on the 3rd of April 1936, and was delivered for full evaluation the same day. During that year, a production run of 21 units was ordered, and like the original JF-1, these were equipped with a 30 caliber machine gun and provisions for wing-mounted bombs. This order was complete in 1927, but like its predecessor, the J-2F would be delivered in a number of variants, and this first production order was not only one of the smallest, but just one of many. 1938 saw the arrival of the J-2F-2, of which Grumman received an order for 30 planes. These were built mostly for the Marine Corps, and were powered by a 790 horsepower version of the Wright Cyclone, and instead of a three-blade, they drove a two-blade propeller. The J-2F-3 was another unarmed version of the Duck. This model was built for US Navy attachés and the Commandant of the US Naval Academy. Outfitted for VIP use as so-called Admiral's Barges, these were recognisable for their dark blue and silver paint scheme. Twenty of these were built, but aside from that, not much is known about them. Production numbers grew rapidly in 1939 and 1940. With the threat of war looming closer, America established new military outposts along its maritime borders. The Duck was well suited to operate from these improvised bases, which were usually shallow inlet facilities that sometimes had nothing more than a simple docking ramp. In September 1939, production of 32 J-2F-4s began. This variant was almost identical as the previous models, with the exception of some slightly modernised equipment in the cockpit. The final model of the Grumman-built Ducks was the J-2F-5, and the first of a 144-unit production order arrived in July 1941. These now had a more powerful 950-horsepower version of the Wright Cyclone, and the engine cowling was broadened to cover the oil cooler for added protection. It was also designed to carry a greater payload, being able to carry 325-pound depth charges for maritime patrol duties. As the war escalated, the US Navy needed Grumman to aid in the production of torpedo bombers and fighters. 
As a result of this, production of the J-2F was transferred to the Columbia Aircraft Corporation based in Long Island. The Columbia-built variant was known as the J-2F-6, and they built 330 units over the course of the Second World War. In total, 584 models of the J-2F would be built, with the majority being the J-2F-5 and the J-2F-6. Though many were retained at bases in the United States, or away from the front during the war, some ducks operated by the Marines and the Navy distinguished themselves in the Pacific, and in one notable event, a J-2F-5 evacuated several VIPs from the Philippines, one of whom was Carlos Romulo, who would later become the President of the Republic of the Philippines. After the war, some ducks were taken from surplus and overhauled for Arctic operations as the OA-12, a name taken from a single duck that was used by the Army Air Force during the war. These ducks were assigned to the 10th Air Rescue Squadron as part of the Alaskan Air Command, and they were operated well into the 1950s. Though often forgotten, or simply not mentioned, the duck also saw some service overseas as Grumman's first export aircraft. Between 1937 and 1959, Argentina would operate 44 aircraft of various models. Some were ex-US Navy models, but some were also purpose-built for export and designated as the G-15 and the G-20. The acquisition of the ducks had facilitated the creation of the first true naval observation squadrons for the Argentine Navy. They formed the eyes of the fleet during a time when radar-equipped ships did not exist, and then later on when they were absent. Ducks were also acquired by Colombia and Mexico, the former acquiring three and the latter two. No records exist for the Colombian models, but it is recorded that the Mexican ducks served in the Veracruz region from 1947 until 1951. A number of ducks went into civil use after the war in the US. Some appeared in films and TV shows, some were used to ferry businessmen from Long Island to Wall Street, and some were even used as firefighting aircraft. For this reason, a number of various ducks survive today, all of them being found in the United States. As far as early design goes, the duck was a huge success for Grumman, and it helped them establish a relationship with the US Navy that led to the development of several iconic aircraft. Some of these would become the backbone for naval air power during the Pacific War, and some would become Cold War legends. But those are all stories for another day. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.